So you've written your book, a lifetime bucket list achievement. Well done. What do you do with it next? How do you get it noticed and read by others? Also, can the way that you market a book apply to other media such as music or screenplay? Let's explore this further. Welcome to Half Hour Mentor. It's Ian Cleverdon here and welcome to the audio podcast series designed to help anyone who wishes to further themselves with their personal hobbies or professional development. The focus in this series being on the creative arts. This week, I catch up with Matthew Smith, director of Exprime, a literary agency and consultancy for both new and established authors. Matthew has nearly 30 years experience in the publishing world and in that time has developed over 3,000 titles spanning print, digital, audio and in fiction, popular reference, academic, professional and business markets. That's quite a lot. He's been a bookseller, a highly successful commissioning editor and publishing director. He's worked in international publishing companies including Pearson and Hodder Headline and leading independents such as Routledge and Kogan Page. Matthew has also founded independent publisher Urbane Publications, providing a global platform for a significant number of debut authors in both fiction and non-fiction. Given that pedigree, there are very few better places to help emerging writers understand what they need to do in order to get their work in the marketplace and also advise on the opportunities and challenges of the publishing world. So, let's hear from Matthew. Matthew Smith, welcome to Half Hour Mentor. Thank you for having me. What was the first job you did or the first job you wanted to do? The first job I had wasn't necessarily what I wanted to do, but um, as a teenager, if you wanted to do anything, you had to have money and you had to work. And uh, my first job was with McDonald's uh, in Chatham High Street. Uh, And McDonald's was slightly different in those days. We're talking 1986. Mm. I had a very natty paper hat. (laughs) I had uh, blue polyester flares, uh, which if you walked too too fast, you used to get sparks. (laughs) Um, And we we only had, I think, literally 15 things on the menu then. Um, And it was very rigorously run and, and... at 16, it's quite hard to be disciplined, but McDonald's was a very disciplined place and you, you got a very clear insight into how a corporation works, runs efficiently, and also how much bloody money they make, mm. uh, even at that time. Astonishing. Um, we had 10 tills and I think uh, each till would make a £1,000 an hour on the weekends. An hour? An wow. hour, yeah. And that was in 1986. 1986. Wow. Yeah. Um, it was uh, really, yeah. So I worked there really... Uh, through my school years um, and uh, one thing I can tell you if you you work on a till on Chatham High Street at midnight in a paper hat you really learn a few things <laughs> both about yourself and other people absolutely particularly other people <laughs> yes. and reactions what what was the dream then so working in at McDonald's I'm taking that perhaps wasn't exactly what you wanted to do for the rest no, of the life. no I, I I always had it I, I think almost drummed into me really I, I was at a grammar school and you didn't go to work then. You were basically being, uh, not groomed, but certainly positioned to go to university. That was the goal really for everybody there. If you if you weren't going to go to university, they were quite keen for you to leave at 16 and get an apprenticeship. Um, obviously, you didn't have to stay at school till you were 18 then. Um, and at one point, I even toyed with leaving at 16, being rebellious and joining the armed forces, but that didn't happen. Um, and so the, the university dream stayed and really all the way through my A-levels, that's all I was thinking about was actually, well, the next three years are going to be spent at a a university. So everything was geared around that and, and to do English literature and language. Is that what you went on to do? That's what I went on to do. Um, and I ended up at Nottingham University. I was very lucky to go there. I, I loved Nottingham. I still do. I think it's an amazing city. Um, and I had three very good years there uh, with some quite incredible lecturers. Uh, I managed to study with um, some poets, some great Shakespeare experts. Um, I even did Old English and it really was, yeah. I, I, I'm not sure now that uh, English literature and language is held in the same esteem. We see courses collapsing everywhere which I think is a real shame because one thing it does is is 
you don't just analyze texts and shut yourself away it allows you to talk to people about words and what they mean mm. and i think we all need that what drew you to english language and literature at that early age i think any teenager who's slightly arrogant and precocious thinks they can write uh, and thinks they have a way with words i was always fascinated by fiction in particular i always enjoyed that i always remember reading my first stephen king novels and it was you know it was like forbidden fruit you know it's, yeah. you're a young teenager and reading exciting horror novels it was incredible that's a definitely different world completely as, yeah. as well and created. you know we it, it sounds a cliche but you do lose yourself in books that's the whole joy of them that you can park everything that's going on in the real world and and lose yourself for out, literally hours so let's move on post university then. So there's the English there's the passion for English language and literature yep. absolutely there. What was the next stage? And what did you want to do particularly? Well, I was very fortunate. I applied for a journalist apprenticeship uh, with a company that ran a number of magazines. I didn't want to be a newspaper journalist, but I wanted to write. And I got accepted on a graduate scheme where uh, they had 10 in-house magazines across a number of subject areas and basically you get a fantastic grounding in writing articles and it, it was my dream job at the time I just thought this is it took my last exams uh, and the company was then bought out and the graduate scheme cancelled so I found myself in June with a degree and and no, no job uh, like so many graduates at the time um, especially English graduates and I did what English graduates still do today. I applied to be a bookseller. <laughs> right. Um, and I was lucky enough to get a job with Waterstones in uh, Maystone in Kent. The, the Waterstones I worked in is not there any longer, but it was a big store and uh, started in at the bottom. Um, £4,300 a year. And I loved it. I just loved that job to bits. What did you love about it? Well, one, if you love books, someone's paying you, okay, admittedly not a great deal of money, and let's be honest, they're still paid a paltry wage for what they do. But you go in and someone just says to you, okay, here are all these books. We want you to get some more books. We want you to decide what you think people want to read. And then we want you to help sell those books and find the right readers for those books. I mean, it's... it's... So is this as, as a, as a um, working in the store... Yes, and you, but you have the ability to be able to put forward what you think is. It, it's. Um, I, I try and explain it as simply as possible. Essentially, you had a budget, and you saw a huge number of publishing representatives every month, and they would pitch their new books to you, and you would use your budget to bring in the books that you thought were going to work for your locality. And this is a store budget. Is it that you have? As a yeah, term? absolutely. And so your fiction budget was obviously enormous, and your budget for cookery was slightly less. And then, but at certain times of the year, your cookery budget, particularly around the time of Delia Smith, would go through the roof, and your fiction budget would come down. So it was very efficiently run. It was run internally within that store, and you'd pitch for your budgets to head office, and you'd get your budget for the year, and then you'd work out how it would be spent. Right. And so if you knew that, uh, you know, you had a huge tranche of Terry Pratchett fans in Maidstone, you'd make sure that you had nothing but Terry Pratchett books in, in your sci-fi. But it allowed you to experiment as well. And you had lots of really interesting discussions with uh, local customers because you'd get to know what they liked. You'd make recommendations. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you'd build up a strong, loyal customer base. And I think that's what independent booksellers in particular are very, very good at doing. So the way that the likes of Waterstones works now, is that very much of a, a, a central decision about what books are bought rather I than think I store? think there are, um, I'm sure there are some very strong, good managers out there who make sure that they get the right books in for their customers because it would be mad not to. Mm. But I'm also convinced that there's a lot of, product that comes to each store that is not made by each store individually but is sent down and they, you know you will have Richard Osman you will have David Williams you will have that's fine because obviously there are there is an audience but it, it, it is really trying to drive the audience to the book rather than 
helping the audience find the right read. So what was the next stage in your career then after Waterstones and, and having that frontline experience, where did that go? Well, I say I love Waterstones, but really I wanted to be paid more than, you know, 200 quid a month. And uh, I started literally applying on spec um, to a number of publishers. And it, it did, from fiction, big fiction publishers all the way through to small academic presses and I will say that, you know, in the early 90s, there were a lot more publishing houses than there, there are now. And it was literally a speculative letter saying, I'm desperate to work in publishing. I mean, you know, people still do this. Publishing is still a hugely popular industry. Uh, but I was very determined. I, I think we, we chatted about this the other day and we worked out I sent well over 200 letters over the course of six months. And that was in the days of sending a letter rather than an email. Oh, handwritten, yeah. Yeah. handwritten letter, um, typed up CV, and um, just speculative. There, there were no jobs. It was literally just writing off and saying, mm. I'll start at the bottom, put me in the post room. And, and it, it, it was luck. It was pure blind luck. I, I was invited to an interview with uh, Routledge for an editorial assistant position on the geography list. Uh, knew nothing about geography, <laughs> um, and but don't tell them that. No, <laughs> and of course it turned out when I when I sat in the interview with the two editors, I probably knew more about books, or or at least the book publishing process than they did because they were there to commission new titles, but they didn't see anything of the process once that book got published or how it sat on a shelf or how a bookseller made a decision about where it would sit in the store or pricing or what we used to have A, B, C and D titles. And they they were just, I think they were slightly frightened really by, I even knew their rep better than they did <laughs> because obviously I'd seen their rep every month, yeah. taking them for lunch, taken in stock so I knew their front list. It was just, yeah. it, it just worked. And so I started um, at uh, Routledge, doubled my wage to a heady £9,500 and worked on New Fetter Lane, which was just off Fleet Street. So I went from working locally to doing that commute to London and walking past St Paul's every day. You said about A, B, C, D lists and front lists and so on. So tell us a little bit about that. How did that work? Well... The thing is, for someone like Routledge, you, in a way, it didn't really matter to them because they were a very strong, at the time, academic and educational publisher. They used to uh, publish everything from uh, very expensive monographs, which would sell 200 copies, but, but at £300 a, a book, uh, through to some, you know, in, in culture in particular and the arts, some really fascinating titles. But still what you class as academic, so academically driven, written by academics, um, often read by academics or, or sold in university libraries. And at the time they were trying really, one, to appeal more to a st student level, so produce more books at a, a, not a, a lower level, but that were more accessible mm. and produce some more trade-led titles. Mm. So looking more at film, um, expanding the culture list looking at acting theater mm. so it was a it was a an interesting time so they weren't really producing the a-led titles so the a-led titles you know like we have now christmas comes up you have your nice celebrity memoir mm. or a, or a strong humor book um or you'd have a, a novel at the time you know if you were waiting desperately for Salman rushdie to write his second book you know that 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 kind of book. Right. Um, so in, in terms of publishing then, how did that develop? And, and how did your career develop in the, the, the world of publishing? Well, the, the one thing I would say immediately is that I think for any, any career that you want to pursue, there's a definite benefit to starting at the bottom. And by the bottom, I mean the person who does all the work <laughs> it essentially helps all those above them do theirs because as an editorial assistant I got a snapshot into every single aspect of the commissioning and publishing process mm. so you're immediately thrown in at the deep end from 
dealing with authors, particularly the difficult authors because the editors didn't want to deal with them, through to the production department, the marketing department, the sales department, uh, all the admin that goes on. Mm. And actually it's the, it's the boring stuff like the admin that teaches you the process. So it, slightly off a tangent here, publishing now, and I think lots of people who are in the business listening would say, oh God, here he goes, is driven by data. So data and data streams and how the data process works has become absolutely key in driving a book's discoverability. Where in those days, the data was actually about making sure a book could get out there. Or of course, the only place it went was a library or a bookshop. And many people were desperately like to get back to those days. Mm. But the data still was key. If you didn't get the data right, so if you got your ISBN wrong or you copped up the blurb or, you know, your copyright page had an issue or God forbid, you know, there was a permissions problem. That's it. The book's dead in the water. So data became key, but also data came in from all sorts of different areas. So I became a bit of a, I have to say, a bit of a, a nerd in that, in that sense, because I learned that actually it was the data that was teaching me all about the role. Uh, but on top of that, you then had the people side. So you had to be very good at dealing with people and finessing problems. That was really the, cru the crux of the role. <laughs> so the, the, obviously the data was probably harder to get in the sta pre-internet stage, if you like. Um, if we move that forward now, I mean, I'm, in I'm interested to know how you, you think publishing has changed in that respect. But we, we now have Kindle, we now have you know, online purchases and so on. So what, how has the world of publishing changed over, say, the last two decades then, from when you were working in it directly? Well, I think there's a there's an external perception that it's now all about ebooks and and all about online, and that that's true to some extent. I mean, li literally the last twenty years, we've seen extraordinary changes, not necessarily in the way that books are produced, um, but certainly in the way that books are sold uh, and that books are discovered. Mm -hmm. You can't have publishing now without Amazon. I'm, I've always been divided about Amazon because it has completely changed the way that publishing is, mm. is done. It has changed the way that publishers sell books. It has changed the way that readers find and interact with authors and new titles and old titles, actually. Mm. But the one thing it, that Amazon is, is it's a very democratic uh retail site because they're not just interested in selling the latest book they're interested in selling any book mm. and if a book starts to sell the algorithms and the data will get behind it and push it to the forefront and i think that a lot of publishers have struggled with that because anyone who was in the business years ago or even coming into the business now i think still has this perception that they would like it to be you discover an amazing author, an amazing new voice, and you publish it, and it gets great reviews, and it, it's in a bookshop, and people go in and, and, and buy it. And I think we still commission books that way, but the market doesn't necessarily respond and, and, and look and find and read books in the same way that they did 20 years ago. So in one way, you know, I think a lot of the published industry is still working 20 years in the past and still trying to adapt to how data works and how readers actually want their books to be. So let's talk about Exprime, what you're doing at the moment then. Yep. Tell us a little bit about what you do because um, having you know looked at your website and the details that you really it looks like you're supporting a lot of authors who want to get published, is that right? Yeah, Exprime, it's been an interesting process and and it's still evolving i think uh, i i'm not sure it, it's actually in the place that i want it to be yet um i, I ran a independent publisher for for eight years i walked away from a, a very good job uh, as a publishing director and started uh, my own publishing house uh, whether it was madness or brilliance uh, <laughs> the jury's still out i think um, and we closed that down in 
uh, May 21. And I wasn't really done with books. I mean, there was a big part of me, actually, that had seen all the changes in the industry and wasn't sure that I was really focused enough or enthused enough to to get back into it. And I certainly didn't want to run a publisher again. Um, one, because I wanted to keep my house, but, but two, because there are so many challenges in publishing that are not of your own making. So entrepreneurially, you often start a business and you have an idea, you have a brilliant idea and you you look at the checks and blocks and you work out where you're going to move to and how it's going to work. In publishing now, there are so many things that can be thrown up that prevent you, even when you've got the great strategy, to, mm. to actually getting a book out there and selling it. And I knew what all the challenges were and I wasn't sure I had the answers at that time. But what I did want to do is, is carry on working with authors because that was the part of the job that I, lo- I loved the most. Mm. And, and not even necessarily developing books, but developing the authors themselves and the way they write and how they write and why they write. Uh, they're, they're the keys for me now because it's, it's a more commercial industry than it's ever been. And I think what we've got is, as with any creative process, we've got people who are in love with the creative process and the commercial aspects come later. Because the commercial aspects are the dirty part. They're the part you don't really want to think about. Because you've written a brilliant song or you've created this amazing novel or you've got this incredible um, story to tell in a memoir. And you really don't want to think at that point about the grubby business of selling it. But the truth is, if you want people to read what you write, you're going to have to sell it at some point. Um, And I, I just think there's... There's still so much that smoke and mirrors around our industry, particularly for for writers, that I wanted to really create a consultancy where people could just get in touch and we could find some way to help them realise their writing dream. I mean, again, it sounds a bit hackneyed, but, you know, that's really what this is. So your support then will be giving a bit of guidance, reading some of the author's work and perhaps saying if you go down a different route. Yeah, so yeah. One, of, one of the things... There are a lot of businesses out there at the moment that offer to provide an editorial assessment of your novel. So they'll charge you X thousand pounds and say, right, you should rewrite that character or change that. I have a bit of a problem with that. Uh, One, because it's essentially one person providing their opinion of another person's work without necessarily knowing whether that is going to make that book more saleable or not. Because frankly, if If there's anyone out there who thinks they have the secret to what makes a saleable book, you know, (laughs) we'd all, we'd all, the rest of us would all be out of business and there'd be one big publisher in the world and no others. So that's just a nonsense. Uh, I I think as well, because for me, when a writer has poured heart and soul into something, the last thing you want is someone turn around and say, well, actually, just make that character... um, a woman and if the killer could be their evil twin and you know but you're like well that's not what I wrote you know that's not what came out mm. I think the first step really is actually moving to the commercial being brave enough to say okay I've written this I've enjoyed writing it I want other people I'm brave enough now to say I want other people to read it but is it a book that other people want to read? And I don't think that's necessarily down to an editorial choice. I think that's knowing your commercial options first. Mm-hmm. Because there are a lot of books that might not necessarily get published by Penguin, but you could publish it yourself and probably do very well. Mm-hmm. And, that's and there's not... a number of success stories in exactly. the industry at the moment about that, isn't it? But it takes a huge amount of effort and it takes a very different approach to the business itself. Mm-hmm. And you have to be very commercially aware and quite astute. Mm. Uh, and you have to have a different a different attitude to books and, and, and readers and how they work. So, for example, the vast majority of authors I've worked with, you know, you ask them really, what, what's your goal for the book? And nine times out of ten, you, you often have to tease it out of them, but it will be, oh, yes. I, I want to be in a Waterstones window and please let me have a review in the Guardian or the Times and let it be talked about on Radio 4 
and it just gradually becomes a massive sleeper hit mm. and uh, then I can take 10 years to write my next novel. The world is very different mm. to that. That does happen still, but very rarely. Mm. And there are some very, very good authors out there who they know their books, they know the audience, they also know what the audience wants and they are almost creating again this horrible word product but they're almost creating a product for that audience which is the smart thing to do in business mm. and they do it very very well and uh, people have heard me talk before about the step from writer to author lots of people think they're the same thing i don't think they're the same thing i think that a writer has to make a conscious decision to become an author and when they do, that's when that commercial side has to kick in. So what's the difference in, between a writer and an author then? If you look at a, 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 a writer who's just finished their first novel, they're still very much a writer. They're, 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 they're still thinking about every single word that's on that page. They're absolutely invested in every single aspect of their key characters. It'll have come out of... of some event in their life or they have been influenced by something they've done or it will be part of them mm. when you're suddenly making that into a product where someone you don't know who lives hundreds of miles away even thousands of miles away it, you want them to open that up but also to pay for it, it it's not it's not your book anymore you have to understand that it's going to change it has to evolve it has to become something else not necessarily the words in it but the way it's presented and the way you think about it it has to be presented in a very different way mm. because it can't just be about the passion that's driven it it can be when you talk to me as an agent about where it's come from but joe or joanne blogs frankly couldn't care less about where it's come from they just want a good thriller or they just want a strong memoir or they're just interested in a new historical fiction and they're interested in the story itself and they're interested in you know the nuances of the character or a particular plot twist they couldn't care less about your inspiration it sounds brutal but you know no. how can they find out they're not going to find out on amazon they, they, they've got an email saying this exciting new book's available for 99p that's what's driven them to it and you've got to get your head around that if you want to make that switch from writer to author. Now, some people stay writers and they do very well at it. I think, you know, Ian McEwen will always be a writer because he's in a very fortunate position now that whatever he produces, his publisher will, will put out. But I'm not necessarily sure that if Ian McEwen was pitching books to an agent now, that he'd necessarily, and this, God, there's going to be people screaming at me now, that he'd necessarily be picked up because let's be honest, it's not an easy sell. Well, let's come to that then, because I'm hoping that there's quite a few listeners to the podcast have that book in them. Right. You know, they, they've got that. They've they've done a screenplay. They've done a book. They think, I've got a great story here. With your experience, what would be the best advice you could give them, perhaps the first steps that they take? This is this is always a really, really difficult question. And, and any time you do a workshop or, or, a, or a talk, you're always asked this. And... I think the first thing is, if, if you've written something and you genuinely want it to be published, you want it out there, you want it in book form, and you want people to read it, you have to decide what kind of author you want to be. You have to decide for yourself where you genuinely want to be with it. You know, if you want to be a great penguin author... You have to take a very different route to someone who's quite happy to self-publish and put their book up on Amazon. And I think the earlier a writer makes that decision about the author that they want to become, that will define your next steps. So my advice would be to actually be honest with yourself. Step away from the creative process that's manufactured this wonderful piece of art. Take a step away and actually say, OK, I want to be an author, but really what kind of author do I want to be? If you want to be a successful thriller writer, do you genuinely want to be writing the 20th book in that series in 20 years' time? Now, it might seem a bit daft to talk about things like that, but what you do next, particularly if you're successful, could define your entire writing career. And 
the number of writers who can stay writers and write what they want and and be successful at it is very very small indeed and i think is getting smaller all the time it sounds a bit joyless doesn't it i'm I'm sorry if it does sound a bit joyless because we do i think everyone in the industry from from the writers themselves through to to editorial assistants through to publishing directors still get a buzz out of books if they didn't they shouldn't they shouldn't be working there but there you, you I think the one thing I've learned is that it can't just be about the joy of the creative process and engaging with words and thinking that, you know, I'm at the forefront of something very exciting. It, you you do have to be very commercial. It's brutal, but it's the way the world works. And unless you want to keep your manuscript in a drawer and bring it out occasionally and say, God, I'm not a bad writer, you have to think that way and you have to decide what route you want to go down. What does the future of the industry look like to you? I still think there's a lot of change to come. And I think the change has to come culturally. Uh, we've, we've had a lot over the last few years in particular about um, the way books are sold, where they're sold, people hating on Amazon or, or deciding that Waterstones aren't doing enough or independent booksellers disappearing, independent publishers disappearing. I, I think like, a bit like the music industry and vinyl, you know, books are not going to go anywhere. Mm. You know, we, we have seen growth in sales. I think, you know, I won't get into that because I think the data can always be skewed. Um, and I think we've got a very different audience now. It's a bit like a Netflix audience. They want immediate gratification. And if they don't get it in one book, they can immediately switch to another for 99p. And it's, you, you know, but I think there's a core audience that will always be there. They'll, they'll read one or two books a week. They'll have favourite authors, but they'll also have favourite publishers. And I think we're going to see that, as I mentioned earlier, that gap widening between, say, the big five and independent publishers. But the strong independent publishers, what they're going to do, I think, if they're smart, is they're going to focus on speaking directly to the audience. They're not going to let the way books are sold drive the way they do business. So they're going to build direct relationships with readers. The readers are going to become known to them for the first time because before a reader has always been anonymous. They're just someone at the end of a website or or who walks into Waterstones. You never meet them. Those independent publishers will make connections with those readers and those readers will show loyalty. And I think that they'll actually pay the money that needs to be paid, whether it's £10 a book or a subscription, for the books that they want and the readers and the, the writers that they, they trust. Mm. So I think that the smart publishers are actually almost going to go full circle and do away with the need for a Waterstones or a WH Smith or an Amazon. And they're going to build strong links with Readers Direct. They're going to build strong links with local bookshops. And they're going to have books that readers desperately want. Limited editions maybe, signed editions... You're going to get people excited again about a book that's coming out and they're not going to be overwhelmed with product, which you might see, say, from a digital publisher who might publish two or three books a day. They're going to have one book a month, but it's going to be a book that everybody buys. So how would you if you think then I'm, you know, I'm in the shoes of an author, I've just done my first book then and thinking of that for the future what would you recommend somebody to do is that to contact publishers to get to -to face-to-face events get to know bookshops what would be the best advice Uh, the the first thing is research your market the number of the number of authors who who write to me send me a proposal because they want me to represent them and try and get them a, a book deal but they've got no idea of where their book even sits amongst competitors so if you've written a book that's exactly the same as Lee Child or you've written a book that's exactly the same as Peter James, yeah, where, where's the differentiation? Are you going to stand, going to stand out for the crowd? Yeah, what, what, what's, your, what's your story? Um, so that's, that's the first thing. I think the other thing is, is that everyone can get published, right? There's nothing to stop you getting published tomorrow. You can, you can upload a Word document on Amazon and have it in book form tomorrow. The problem is, is no one will know it exists and you won't sell any copies at all. And there's no one on your side except yourself. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. And I think we will see, you know, we've seen some really, we mentioned it earlier, we've seen some some great 
self-published authors who really know their business and know their audience, but they're really doing what the independent book publishers should be doing now. They know their audience Mm -hmm. and they're gradually growing that audience because they're, they're really targeted on what they're doing. And I think that's exactly what everyone should be doing now because, you know, Penguin are always going to have a million quid to throw at a book. It, it, like I said, it's not nothing to do with the real world. You almost have to ignore that and you have to focus in on what's the right route for you. It goes back again. You know, you're stepping from writer to author. What route are you going to take? And if you can find someone to give you advice on that, like me or, or, or others or other authors, you know, this is what social media is very good at doing, you know, follow a few authors and ping them a question. Some of them are really nice people. Final question for you, Matthew. Yeah. And, and it's something that I ask all of my guests is knowing what you have know now and what you've learned over the years, what one piece of advice would you give to that, um, you know, the, the, the teenager working at McDonald's? You know what? I, I think this is such a fascinating question, particularly having worked for since I was 16. So I've been, I've been working now, you know, 40 years solidly, uh, always been in work, never been out of job. And the one thing I would, would say is the job isn't everything. That's, that's the first thing. But also lose a bit of the arrogance and don't take anything personally because it is just a job. It, we all become very invested in what we do. And I think particularly if you're in a creative industry, you, you really can throw heart and soul into it. Or if you're an entrepreneur or... You know, even if you're working in a bank, you know, you become the best at what you do. And then every single knock or slight can seem very, very personal. It can seem that it's directed against you. The one thing I learned from working in big corporations is no one cares less, <laughs> really, about whether you're upset or not. What you've got to do is focus on, on your job and doing the best you can. And you know what? Coming home at night and being happy with everything else uh, around you and having time to do that. Again, these are cliches, but... You do learn the hard way, the things that matter, and uh, your job can matter, but don't let it be the only thing that matters. Matthew Smith, thanks very much indeed. A pleasure. Thank you, Ian. There can't be many in the publishing world who have experienced so many aspects of the business, and I found his insight into the differences between a writer and an author very interesting. What really resonated with me, though, was the point about being ready to write a series of books if your first one is successful. The same could apply to musicians, for example, who find themselves with an unexpected hit on their hands. How many would have an album or two of quality songs ready to go? It also made me think of crime author, or is that a writer, Malcolm Hollingdrake in the last episode, as he mentioned that he was keen and very prepared to write a series in order to develop his characters, and he'd actually written three of his Harrogate series before signing a publishing deal. Do go and have a listen to that episode if you haven't already, as it's a really good companion to this one. Also, look out for an interview with another very successful million-selling author later in the series. My thanks go to Matthew for his time and inspirational advice. You can find out more about him and his team at Exprime by following the link to the website in the show notes. Stay tuned for a bonus episode following the day after the release of this one. If you've enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to the series wherever you get your pods and review the back catalogue. You can leave feedback about the episode through social media by searching for Half Hour Mentor or via the email link in the show notes. Thanks for joining us and until next time, bye for now.